I only started watching anime about a year ago, after the persistent yet gentle encouragement of my viewers and my fiancé. And the first anime on my list to watch was the one that was by far recommended to me the most, Serial Experiments Lane. Almost immediately upon watching Lane, I understood why people were pushing me to check it out. It was a fictional meditation on the two subjects that I discuss most frequently on my channel. One subject is psychology, and the other is the concept of divinity. Lane put forward a questionable, yet reasonable, pathway to becoming a god. One which borrowed from real-life psychoanalytic concepts, as well as the concept of cybernetic augmentation. Simply put, if I connected my brain to the internet, and downloaded to my brain all the information I needed in order to become the ideal human being, could I become something like a god? After all, god is the highest ideal, right? So how close could I get? Obviously, the greatest thing preventing humanity from achieving godhood is our mortal flesh. To become a true god, we would either have to perfectly augment or get rid of our flesh. But is this worth it? Well, actually, Serial Experiments Lane argues against becoming a god, suggesting that it would not only invalidate the meaning that comes from the journey of life, but invalidate the thing that makes human beings special, which is their mortality and their consciousness thereof. Nonetheless, I and many other viewers were intrigued by what the state of godhood might reasonably look like, even if being a god forsook the benefits of being human, could it be all that bad to be a god? Well, in the mind of Lane's writer, Jackie J. Konaka, it would actually be the worst thing imaginable. And he gives a very good argument for this in his follow-up anime series, Techno Lies. In my opinion, this series is equal to Lane in its philosophical quality with its meditations on divinity and the attainment thereof. Yet it's obviously not as popular, and I would say for good reason. Lane was half the length of Techno Lies, and had somewhat of a Lynchian element to it, where part of the fun was understanding the show's underlying mysteries and deriving the philosophy therefrom. Techno Lies is the antithesis of fun. And I don't say that just because the subject matter is emotionally brutal. It's also because Techno Lies is incredibly slow. It's bad enough that every episode is saturated with lifeless landscapes and ubiquitous suffering. But what makes matters worse is that it draws this out for so long before it actually gets to the point it's trying to make. For this reason alone, I don't fault those who were unable to stomach this anime. But I will say that if you are able to stick with it to the end, you will understand why the show made the artistic decisions it did. It all culminates in a series of philosophical insights that, like I said before, are not only equal to Lane, but are generally greater than most anime out there. Now here's the inevitable question that many of you who are unfamiliar with Techno Lies are asking themselves. Should I watch the series before I watch this video? Normally, I actually say that people should go watch or play something before they watch my analysis. But this time, I'm going to make a rare exception. I think that having some of the show's concepts explained beforehand will actually make watching the show less of a slog. Better yet, it will help people gain an appreciation for those slow sections if they understand why they need to be there in the first place. It's up to you. If you want to watch it knowing nothing at all, you can watch it on YouTube for free. I will link to it in the description box. I will inevitably present the anime's version of Human Transcendence, but I think it's most appropriate to save that for closer to the end, especially because we don't really see it until the end of the anime anyway. I will say, however, that the project of Human Transcendence involves a couple of different groups. One of those groups are those that live on what the anime refers to as the surface. Prior to the beginning of the series, there was a section of humanity that was ready to abandon their flesh and become perfect beings. 
but there were also those that conscientiously objected to transcendence. The humans that objected would not fit in with those who wanted perfection. Thus, the humans who wanted to remain imperfect were rounded up against their will and placed onto trains, so they could be transported to an underground city called Lux. This would allow those on the surface to achieve their goal unimpeded. This was obviously a recipe for disaster. Transporting people to an underground city, cut off from the outside world, a place with limited resources and no pre-established form of government, would obviously lead to societal decay. There are a few groups that try to make things better, but they are all morally questionable and ineffective, mainly because these groups are ideologically driven gangs. They all use their ideology as justification to commit violence against each other. Due to this, most people in Lux have given up hope that anything will get better, but they continue to live, either out of hope or blind instinct. This fact is personified most clearly in the main character Ichisei. He was born into the hellscape of Lux. His parents died at a young age, and he had to make a living as a prize fighter. At the beginning of the anime, he is running away from his employers due to a misunderstanding. He unfortunately gets caught, and has his arm and leg sliced off for the insubordination. He is then left to wander the streets with his severed limbs in tow. Amazingly, he never gives up on living, despite his arguably hopeless state. In the second episode, a character known as Doc comes across Ichisei in the streets. She is impressed with the strength of Ichisei's resolve, and decides to perform an act of charity. She uses her scientific acumen to gift Ichisei Technolize, which is the name this anime gives to the highly advanced prosthetics one can attach to their body. She hopes that by gifting these prosthetics to a man whose will was this strong, he could do some good for himself and the City of Lux. Moreover, if he succeeds, she can further technolize him into the aforementioned perfect being. But her wishes are not necessarily his. We will come back to Ichisei in a few minutes. At this point, I want to transition into one of the show's most philosophical elements, which I will introduce via the character Ran. She provides the answer to whether or not there is hope for a better future for Lux. And I mean that literally. Ran was born into a spiritual society known as Gabe. Every generation, Gabe encounters a person in their midst that has the ability to see the future. For this generation, that person is Ran. It is Ran's duty to tell the people of Gabe what she sees, and for the people of Gabe to not only accept that vision of the future, but to ensure it arrives without resistance. When Ran looked into the near future, she saw the downfall of Lux and the extinction of humanity. All the suffering that the people of Lux have endured would be for nothing. One of the inevitable questions that arises is whether or not the future can be changed. The simple answer is that while certain events leading up to the future can be changed, the conclusion cannot. Characters like Ran, Ichisei, and the other characters in the anime are left to deal with this reality. While some are aware of Ran's prophecy and others are not, the anime uses these characters as representatives for a philosophical response. The anime does offer a correct response to these revelations, though admittedly it's hard to see given how pessimistic the entire show is, and that pessimism is given greater effect due to the show's slow pace and the constant focus on the surrounding bleakness. The correct response to that pessimism is one that you sort of have to figure out for yourself, by contrasting the merits and deficits of the different philosophies put on display. But once you figure it out, that response can be useful to those who believe we live in a deterministic universe, devoid of free will and inherent meaning. Of course, as I alluded to since the beginning, one of the responses to this philosophical conundrum does involve transcending the human condition. If there is no inherent meaning to suffering, then to some, it might be worthwhile to eliminate suffering altogether. And they do that through transcendence. 
This quote-unquote transcendence takes two forms. The first form deals with the surface dwellers. After they banished the humans to the underground, they did things to negate anything that might be considered human. Things like mortality and irrationality. The results of their efforts was something the anime refers to as theonormal. Now, like a lot of things in this series, a theonormal isn't explained very well. All we can gather is that the theonormals are like ghosts. They can appear and disappear. And when you can see them, they are completely apathetic to any sort of sensation in the world around them, positive or negative. Whatever the theonormals did, they were able to give up their hold on any sort of worldly passion and, as is promised in Buddhism, transcend their flesh as a result. How they got to this state is unclear, although there are hints that it was the product of technolization. I say this because the other form of transcendence involved this type of augmentation. In the anime, there is a secret group of elites called the Class. A member of this class, named Kano, saw human beings as irreparably damaged, and the only way to save humanity from themselves was to strip them of every possible human element, via technolization. Towards the end of the anime, Kano sends out an army of cyborgs known as Shapes. These are people that have been almost completely technolized, and their mission is to turn the remaining humans into Shapes. In Kano's mind, doing this is a good thing because it would allow human beings to have near-eternal lives, and they wouldn't have to worry about survival. However, once the mass technolization was complete, these shapes would develop roots beneath their feet, and remain stationary for eons, leaving them alone with their minds and nothing else. Allah, I have no mouth and I must scream. Both of these methods of transcendence are responses to life's meaningless suffering and humanity's inevitable doom. Now, to some people, being a theonormal or a shape would be ideal. Using technology to achieve mental and physical divinity would, theoretically, eliminate all suffering. If it weren't for technolization in this universe, divinity might have only been reserved for the truly penitent, if you believe in that. But now, everybody could have it. But is this truly desirable? Is stagnancy, be it in the shell of a shape, or on the surface world, something that we should embrace? Thankfully, there are other characters in the anime that provide a contrasting argument, so that we can make an informed conclusion. At the beginning of the anime, a man named Yoshi travels from the surface world to Lux, to observe humankind and how they differ from his culture. He witnesses the same type of stagnancy in Lux, but unlike with the surface world, he does see the potential for growth and development in humanity, a quality that is inherent to imperfection. Having grown tired of the apathy brought on by the quote-unquote perfection, the stagnancy on the surface, he decides to shake up the power structure in Lux by creating chaos. He murders members of the various gangs and blows up their offices, all the while making it seem like the perpetrator was from a rival gang. In any other circumstance, Yoshi's actions would be considered evil, and rightly so. But here, the chaos he sows has an undeniably moral element. It reminds me of Dostoevsky's Underground Man, a character that I've cited a number of times on this channel. In Dostoevsky's book, Notes from the Underground, the main character, the Underground Man, says that human beings would not be able to tolerate any sort of perfection. If a human were in a state of perfection, or at least a state where everything is at a standstill, the first thing they would do is destroy everything around them just so something interesting would happen. Inherent to that destruction is chaos and suffering, but at least that chaos is something new and exciting. At least it's not nothing. And between nothing and chaos, chaos has the slight moral advantage. Because with chaos, there is the possibility for order. Between Yoshi and the Perfectionists, we see two potential responses to human suffering and its potential meaninglessness. 
with the perfectionists, we see a pessimistic philosophy akin to Arthur Schopenhauer. He, like the Buddhists he took inspiration from, saw life as something that should be denied, because life's suffering, to him, was inexcusably painful. Yoshi's philosophy is akin to that of somebody like Friedrich Nietzsche, who embraced life's meaninglessness as a call for people to create their own meaning. So, which is the right response to make in the face of mankind's meaningless demise? It's harder to say than you might think. On the one hand, our answer may differ depending on the emotional state we're in. Take Doc, for example. She fell into despair when she found out that the perfect state she desired for Ichisei was already achieved by Kano and, arguably, the Theonormals. Her emotional state was compounded when she saw how it was driving humanity into extinction. Her ultimate fate would give Schopenhauer's philosophy a point in its favor, but it would also be a point against him because transcending the flesh made things worse. Like with so many philosophical questions, we find ourselves with no objective answer. At this juncture, the best we can do is deduce the author's opinion and debate it. If Serial Experiments Lane was any indication, Chiaki J. Konaka believed that trying to transcend human suffering was a misguided endeavor. To try and reach the end without doing the work necessary to get there would be like using cheat codes to reach the end of a difficult video game. It is the triumph over adversity that is valuable. Technolize comes to the same conclusion, despite the fact that the series acts as one giant argument against Kanaka's position. Even if the suffering endured by the people in the hellscape of Lux will result in no ultimate good, one can still embrace the chaos and try to make their own meaning out of it before the end. And like I said before, chaos is better than nothing. This is something that Ichisei only realizes towards the end. For the entirety of the anime, he had wandered blindly from place to place. He continued to do this even after he received the prosthetics from Doc. It didn't provide Ichisei with the new lease on life that Doc was expecting. It didn't matter to him where he ended up or what he did. In a way, he was the incarnation of the Schopenhauerian blind will. It was only when the apocalypse was nigh that Ichisei realized that he could have done something that would not have only been meaningful to him, but to Ran. For the entirety of the anime, Ran followed Ichisei around, keeping him company. He was the one that Ran told the prophecy to, and the inherent horror of that prophecy was what linked these two emotionally. Ichisei realized how disturbing it must have been for a young girl to see that hopeless future. He figured that, maybe before the end, he could have taken Ran to the surface. Even if the surface was a monument to the sins of mankind, he could turn it into something good. It could be a peaceful place to visit before the end. That would have been the Nietzschean approach that Yoshi took, but minus the chaos. It might not have had an ultimate meaning, but it would have had meaning nonetheless. Unfortunately, Ichisei was too late to do this. Ran died in the ensuing chaos when Kano tried to take over with his shapes. In his despair, Ichisei murders Kano and retires to a dark corner of the world, where he passes away. Technolies demonstrated the power of Lane's original message by putting it under immense strain. Though suffering can make life seem unbearable and bleak, the value of life lies in facing that suffering courageously and attempting to make something good out of it. Ichisei failed to do this, but we don't have to. There are many opportunities in our everyday lives to do something meaningful for ourselves or our fellow man. Best of all, Technolize demonstrated that we don't need artificial limbs or money or power to do this. All we have to do is have the will to say yes to the journey of life. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. That helps me out a lot. Also, if you've been watching my videos for a while and enjoy them, please consider supporting me on Patreon or joining my new members section. 
The last two videos I've done were both demonetized by YouTube, despite my best efforts to appease the system. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the near future, and your support will help keep the train rolling in a positive direction. Until next time, remember to stay safe and stay yellow.